Ben just shot himself. Is he conscious? Ben! Yes! Ben! Why did you do that, Ben? Hurry up. We got him coming. So Kelly, I noticed that this case isn't our typical cold case. It's only about three years old. It's kind of nice for a change, huh? Yeah. For the first time, we actually had the elected prosecutor ask us to help with the case to see if we could bring in some new eyes. On January the 26th, 2012, 24-year-old Ben Cooper was found by his wife, Samantha Price, lying on their bedroom floor with a gun beside him and a fatal gunshot wound to his head. Even though it was an apparent suicide, the police suspected foul play. So Ben Cooper and Samantha Price, they were only married two and a half weeks before his death. And we know that Ben had a lot of psychological issues. Ben was an easygoing, sweet boy, but it's kind of sad because the same sensitive nature that drew people to him also made him vulnerable to the darker emotions he often felt. Even when it seems obvious as a suicide, you always treat it like a murder. And then you let the facts lead you to... Confirm or rebut. Right. There's only one witness, Samantha Price, and she said the victim killed himself. He has access to a gun then why would she not be telling the truth? If it ends up being that her story is plausible, maybe we can get this cloud off of her head. True, and as far as why they got married and what possibly could have gone so wrong, two and a half weeks later, we have no idea. We gotta try and figure it out. It has been 16 years and still no answer. At least consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Hello. Hello, how are you? How are you? How are y'all? John Ward, nice prosecutor. Nice to meet you. Orlando. Jeremy Darty. I'm excited that a prosecutor wants some help. In a small county, we don't have a lot of resources. So when I reached out, I reached out for a purpose. Well, show us where you want us to work, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Being invited by the prosecutor himself is like being invited by my own people. If he wants us to do something, that's what we're going to do. Thank you again. And I'm excited about it, and I hope that we can make some progress. If this happens at the beginning of 2012, y'all never have really quit working on this case, then. You never put it to the side. No, it sat on the top of my desk, and I looked at it, and try to figure out what more things that we can do. This, from the beginning, has been the most important case that I've ever had to investigate. Uh, so it's always been front and center for the past three years. How old was Ben when this happened, Jeremy? He was 24 years old. A baby. Everybody said he was sweet, though. And... Yeah, that's right. Everybody said that he was very intelligent. Uh, he loved children. He thought of himself as like a guardian to his nieces and nephews. He moved in with Samantha about six months before all this. Samantha Price was the 29-year-old mother of a five-year-old little boy. They met in the fall around October of 2011, and they ended up getting married in January 2012. And when they got married, it seems like things kind of went downhill pretty quickly. Can you start out by telling us what happened that night? It was January 26, 2012. At approximately 11 p.m. that evening, Samantha Price had called 911 to report that her husband, Ben, had shot himself. The fire department arrived on scene. They saw Benjamin Cooper laying face up in the doorway of his bedroom with a single gunshot wound to the head. Then ended up dying en route to the hospital. So what all do we know happened that night based on what Samantha told y'all? Well, Samantha told us is that night they'd been drinking. They'd had an argument because Ben wanted to go to sleep and he wanted Samantha allegedly to come to sleep with him, but she wanted to stay up and play on the computer and listen to music. He gets into an argument with me, it escalates, and he says, well, you, I don't even want to be here. After the argument, Ben left. Samantha says she calls Ken, which is Ben's dad, to have Ken come get Ben. And at some point, Ben comes back. 
and it reportedly breaks the glass on the back kitchen door. When he kicked the back door in, I was actually really scared then. So I went back into my bedroom and locked the bathroom door. Since Samantha claims that she was in the master bath, uh, when she heard what she describes as the balloon popping, she opens the door and allegedly sees Ben laying on his back with his hands down by his side, the gun still in his left hand. Okay. And everybody there is thinking this just doesn't add up. I mean, the way that Ben was shot, I mean, he was shot in the lower center base of his skull. And I've worked a lot of suicides, and nobody's ever shot themselves in the back of the head, in my experience. Right. And so obviously that was the first red flag was where he was shot. I haven't worked many questionable suicide cases, but I know it's not common to see self-inflicted gunshot wounds to the back of the head. It doesn't necessarily make this a murder, but it's a big reason the police have always had doubts about Samantha's story. All right, guys, we're going to start off with, is this a suicide? Set the mood for that night, according to Samantha. They're fighting. She says that they've both been drinking. Consistency, she tells dad, she tells 911, she tells the cops. Samantha consistently says suicide. And also, from hearing him on the 911 tape, dad seemed to be going along with it. 911, do you have an emergency? Yes, my son's shot himself, and the ambulance is supposed to be en route. It seems like he believed it, too. And the dad confirmed that he had been diagnosed with mental illness. He'd been hospitalized for it before? Yes. Considering Ben's history of mental instability and past hospitalizations for depression, there's a very real possibility that he took his own life. So understanding his mindset at the time will be crucial to this case. You know, that's a lot of points that we're going to need to address under suicide. Now we need to focus on our only suspect, Samantha Price. What's your number one reason why you don't think this is a suicide, Jeremy? So the entrance wound is in the back of his head. And the lie she made about the gun, she said that she Never seen the gun before. She didn't know where Ben got it. Where did the gun come from? I'm not sure. When does she start to change to, it is my gun, and it was in my panty drawer? Yeah, that was after we brought her back down to the Grafton Police Department. OK, well, it was my gun. My dad gave it to me. And then she changes to? Trying to cover for Ben because he's got mental issues, and she didn't think he's supposed to have a gun. I was seriously afraid that you guys would think it was Ben's gun. He is not supposed to be allowed to own a gun if he's ever been committed. When I saw the interview, she's sitting there and lamenting and crying and all that, and I couldn't tell if she knew that she's being filmed. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I'm watching her going, OK, it seems pretty genuine, but where's the camera? How obvious is it? I'd have to double check on that. <laughs> oh, my God. This case is tricky. There are only two people that know what happened that night, and one of them isn't alive to tell his side of the story. Either Samantha is innocent, and we need to allow her time to mourn and move on with her life, or she's a killer, and we need to do everything that we can to put her behind bars and get justice for Ben. We're going to go meet Marcia and Kenneth Cooper. They're Ben's parents. And they're not together anymore? No, they're not together anymore. They do keep in contact with me quite frequently. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. Nice to meet, meet you, too. sir. Nice to meet you. Well, we just wanted to come and check in with you. OK. Um, what are your best memories of your son? Easy kid, easy baby. He was always happy. Did he ever talk about what he wanted to do when he got older? He came home one day and he said, I know what I'm going to do, Dad. I want to be a forest ranger, which I thought he would be great at. You know, it was more than just a father-son type experience. To me, Ben was my best buddy. That night where Samantha calls you, what are you thinking about everything? Samantha called me and told me that they had had a fight, and I said, Give him the phone and let me talk to him. There won't be any problem. She ultimately did just hand him the phone, and he was fine. She handed him the phone? Mm -hmm. First thing he said is, I think I really screwed up, Dad. It was the first thing he said. When Ben says to you, I think I really screwed up, Dad, you think he's talking about? The fight that they had and him walking out. Breaking the door. And then breaking the door. And I said, well, anything can be fixed, you know? And I said, I, I got plastic, I got tape. That's what I was planning on doing, patching up the door and getting him out of there. Okay. And I was at the red light. She calls me. She says, 
Ben just pulled a gun from somewhere and shot himself. And, and I said, what do you mean he just pulled a gun from somewhere and shot himself? You know, because I couldn't believe what she said. When I got to Ben, he was laying close to the doorway of the bedroom with his hands above his head. And he was lying there, still breathing, but in gasps. Have you not heard all this before? I'm sorry. Everybody says, I know what you feel like, but unless you've lost a child, there's an emptiness that is just like someone yanked out a part of your heart and there's a big hole and you nothing fills it up. I know it's difficult. We wouldn't put you through this unless we thought there was potential. I understand that, and okay. I, I'm grateful that you I all came. I appreciate it. Give me a hug. Oh, OK. Just hang in there, OK? Oh, thank you. To lose your child is something that I can't even imagine how you stand. I don't really know how you live the rest of your life with all that spinning around in your head. This will be your case. You remember your whole career. Oh, yeah. Yes, I do. Oh, my gosh. I've seen you forever. I know. This is Jeremy. Jeremy, Jeremy I'm Yolanda. Yeah, nice to meet you. Meet you. Have, have we had one younger, Yolanda? <laughs> no, he's pretty young, okay? <laughs> I'm here in Taylor County, West Virginia, to help determine if the 2012 shooting death of Ben Cooper was a suicide or a homicide at the hands of his wife, Samantha Price. You ready to talk to Mr. Nodell and Courtney? Yeah. The ballistic experts? Yes. When determining whether a gunshot wound is self-inflicted, it is important to understand the location, orientation, and trajectory of the wound. So at the request of prosecuting attorney John Board, we brought in two ballistics experts, Matt Nodell and Max Courtney. What does the firearm tell us to start with? The firearm is called a REC P8 LA Fury 25 semi-automatic pistol. I've mocked in a line to represent the approximate direction of the bullet entering in the center of the back of the head, traveling upward and leftward to the left temple region. What do you mean by hard contact? Hard contact is a situation when the firearm is pressed directly against the wound. So it's your belief that the gun was pressed against the head? Yes. And sometimes the perimeter of the gun can cause a small wound or injury. And if this wound is in fact associated with the front part of the gun itself, the firearm would be leveled left and right. So can you achieve this orientation with a non-suicide? Of course, it would be Price, the only other adult there. So we modeled a shooter who would represent Price and how she could achieve this process. So certainly, she can deliver this shot. It's easy to see how Samantha may have approached Ben from behind and pulled the trigger. But what's really important is to find out if it's physically possible for Ben to have fired that fatal shot himself. If it's not, that's all the evidence we need to say this was a homicide. Explain to me the process of him shooting himself, because she's saying that the gun was in his left hand. He was laying in the floor on, I believe, on his left side, which he is left-handed. Can he do it with his left hand? If we hold the gun in a traditional manner, um, I would say it's essentially impossible. But there is a way, if you put your thumb in the trigger and then bring it over the top of your head, now I can achieve that same path that we know has to occur. But he would have to then achieve a, a fairly exotic situation. The easiest way for this to occur is for somebody to deliver that shot to the back of his head. That's the easiest way. But I have to consider all the other options as well. So I, I don't really lean strong one way or the other. As Matthew pointed out, you've got a very complex case here. If it is a suicide, can you take that the replica gun and show us how you think that works? You got your are you pulling the trigger with your thumb? Yes. Yes. So, so y'all are both in agreement that the only way he commits suicide left-handed is using his thumb to pull the trigger. Unless he's more limber than I am. And the only way is upside down and it's just so complicated, and it doesn't make sense. And you might miss. Because I might want to miss. You're going to do a trick shot? There are things that push me this way and push me this way. 
if you can find additional information, maybe there is something that would convince me that it's either a homicide or a suicide. Ballistics evidence alone can't rule out the possibility that Ben committed suicide. And even though it's not a conventional way to shoot yourself, the fact that it's possible could create reasonable doubt. There's several in the jury. We have a physical possibility. I don't think it's impossible for him to get like that. It's clear that we're going to need more evidence to figure out once and for all who pulled that trigger. Hey, girl, we'll see you after a while at the crime scene. Okay. Yolanda's going to meet us later at the crime scene. But first, it's important for us to learn all that we can about Ben's state of mind and the state of his marriage at the time of his death. Thank you. So we're going to go talk to members of the Nelson family who were very close friends of Ben. So we understand that Ben saw you like his mom. Yeah, he was like my son I never had. He, you know, that's he that's was, what we heard. We heard you guys really close. Yeah, I, I look, really love that kid. Did he ever talk to you about his mental state? Ben kind of had a low self-esteem because he used to be a fat kid. And in his mind, he was always still that fat kid. You know, he never thought that he was worthy and that he would never have a girlfriend and a wife. And when he met Samantha... He brought her over to introduce her to me. And I really just didn't like her from the, because she was just so overbearing. She wouldn't even let him finish his own sentences. And within 15 minutes, I looked at him and I said, scrape him off, Ben, scrape him off. What does that mean, scrape him off? Just be done with him, just, just run. Do you want to run to Kim's house since we're right here? Okay. Oh, so she's close to where her mom lives. Yeah. Hi, Kim. Nice to meet you. Orlando Martinez. Kim Nelson was the one who first introduced Ben to Samantha. Tell me a little bit about Ben. He was a loner, mm -hmm. and he was so desperate for affection or any kind of attention, he didn't care who he got it from because all the girls he would go after were batshit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and... My mom always said, don't stick it crazy. Just don't. And he did it every time. Would you say that he was a depressed person? Very much. Very, very much. He tried killing himself several times. Over a lot of breakups, he would get drunk, pop pills, and just see if it killed him. Why do you think he was uh, trying? Because he was that lonely. He was that depressed. And he thought he would never find anyone that would love him. He wanted a family. We knew Ben had thought about suicide, but we weren't sure if he'd actually attempted it before. It makes you wonder if something happened that night that threatened the family life that he so desperately wanted that caused him to follow his suicidal pattern. Only this time, he succeeded. We've learned from Ben's close friends, the Nelsons, that he had a history of suicide attempts and depression, which may have led to him taking his own life three years ago. Kayla Nelson is the youngest of the three Nelson sisters and lived with Ben for a period of time before he met Samantha. I heard you and Ben were close. I wonder we if you could tell me how you met. We met when I was like 12. He was my sister's best friend in high school. And then he stayed with me for quite a few months when I lived on my parents' property. And he left, and three months after that, we found out he was married, and then he died. When it, when it started being said that Ben committed suicide, what did your family say? Uh, well, none of us th thought it was suicide. I mean, he was the one who always told me that suicide was a coward's way out, so he wouldn't do it. Ben said and, that to you? Yeah. What other little things have you thought of through the years? left-handed, by the way, just so you guys know. Uh -huh. He's really shitty with a gun. I mean, he lived with us at camp, so we had to kind of show him how to defend himself because there was coyotes and oh, really? all that stuff. Just to hear that he'd shoot himself with a gun is actually kind of frightening because he didn't even really want to shoot the gun. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful, Kayla. Thank you. Yeah. We were pretty stupid to not think about the idea that if Ben lived out on the land with Kayla, there would have been weapons around and she would be the best person to talk about his familiarity with weapons and how he shot them. And what she has to say is so very, very important. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Kelly. 
Ben's grandmother, Judith, was close to Ben, and he visited her often. Is there anything that you can say as far as you don't think that Ben committed suicide? I mean, can you give us some reasons why? His, his world was starting to open up. He, he, he had problems up until then, and most of it was because he couldn't get a good job, and he didn't have a money, and he didn't have a car. But he got that application for that glass factory, and it was just like it was the new, the, the beginning. He was happy. He'd walk down those stairs with the biggest smile on his face that I'd never seen on him before. After talking to all these witnesses in Ben's life, we're getting mixed responses about his mental state. But that's the challenge you have in investigating potential suicide cases. The only person who really knew what was going on in Ben's head was Ben. How are y'all? Nice to meet you. Ben's sister, Shannon Cooper, was as close to Ben as anyone and may be the one person that he confided in the most. Their father, Ken, has offered to bring her in to the prosecuting attorney, John Board's office, to meet with us. Did your brother ever mention anything about his relationship with Samantha? He caught her on the computer talking to another guy. They got into a fight about that. Did he ever come up to you and say, hey, sis, I really got a problem with her? Like, December, I get a phone call from my brother, and he was like, can you come get me? And he said, oh, well, Samantha's yelling at me. And he told me that she called him a piece of shit. I can hear her yelling in the background. But who the, who the hell are you on the phone with? You need to get off the effing phone. So he hung up. Phone rings again. It was her that called me this time. I said, if you hurt my brother's feelings, you're going to have to answer to me. And she was like, well, go ahead, go ahead. I'll tell you where I live. I got guns at my house. She's like, I'll just and kill you. Samantha threatening to kill Shannon isn't just evidence of her temper and aggressive behavior. It also shows how, in a fit of rage, the first thing that came to her mind was a gun. Tell John about your phone conversation with your son. I said, I'm coming out. He said, OK, I'm going to get my stuff. I'll be ready when you get here. Ben cared about my dad more than anyone else ever. He wouldn't have told you. He wouldn't have told you to come get him for you to see him like that. He would not have done that. He cared about you too much to do that because if Ben would have done something like that to himself, he would have made sure you didn't know about it. It's pretty clear that Ben and his dad were very close. So why in the world would Ben let his dad walk in the room and see him lying there like that, shooting himself in the back of the head? It doesn't make any sense. We're actually doing a mock crime scene today. You yeah, were borrowing this building because Samantha still lives in the same trailer where this happened, so we couldn't really get in there. So we're going to go out there where we're going to See if we can try to visualize this a little bit more, what really happened that day. Right around this corner. After you. Hey, guys. Hello. Yeah, this yeah. is the general layout. Yeah, nice job. We're meeting our ballistics experts to try to gain a clearer picture of the events that night. Right here is about where Ben's body was found laying. His head was about right where I'm standing, his feet down toward this way large pool of blood around where Ben's head was laying. There's a smaller pool of blood down here. And then there's a little bit of blood on the side of the bed sheet over there. Let's set up the scenario for a minute. There's obviously some disaster happening in this house that night, OK? You got two people fighting. It's bad. It's a bad, bad fight. He leaves, but then for whatever reason does come back. Let's say he does break that window. We all know they're not on their honeymoon tonight. This is going downhill fast between the two of them. We know that tempers were flaring between Ben and Samantha that night, but it's unknown what actually motivated the shooting. So whether or not Ben's death was a suicide hinges largely on how plausible Samantha's story is. We've only been married, what, two weeks and one day? And this is a disaster.
We're at our mock crime scene trying to figure out if Ben Cooper might have shot himself back in 2012 like his wife Samantha claimed or if she shot him. Let's stick to what we know happened in this case. Samantha's initial story to the police was that after arguing with Ben, she went into the bathroom and shut the door. Then after hearing what sounded like a balloon pop, she opened up the door and found Ben lying on the floor. So she hears pop, comes out, sees a situation here, and she, she cradles his hand and for the first time realizes blood and that she's got to call 911. And at some point, she talks about picking up his, his arms on this smooth floor. I can get him about that far. We just don't know why she moved him or what was the point. She says yeah. the dogs. Yeah. Right. That's all we know. So I grabbed his arms. I got him up above him. And I grabbed his arms and pulled a little bit. I'm like, come on, Ben. Come on. But how does doing this to that keep the dogs away? The fact that Samantha moved Ben's body is odd, but not necessarily suspicious. It does, however, raise the question if there was anything else that doesn't make sense about the rest of her story. If we're going to troubleshoot her story, she's in the bathroom and unavailable. The bathroom opened up into the bathroom at that direction. There's piles and piles of clothing all jammed up against the doorway here, so you wouldn't have been able to pull the doorway shut. OK, so right there, that's the crux of her story, that she's in the bathroom with the door shut. If the clothes on the floor prevented Samantha from even shutting the bathroom door, it's possible she wasn't even in the bathroom at the time of Ben's shooting. But did she pull the trigger? John, since you're the one that's going to have to make the hard decision on this, why don't you commit suicide with the left-hand scenario and let Matt walk you through it? Because you're the one that's going to have to do this. So, yeah, you're very close. That's, that's, that's approximately it. it. And, and then down a little bit more, you so can, like this. Right. Or you can bend, if you can bend your head forward a little more, that will achieve the same situation. That contorted description he just gave, what's simpler, that or this? Certainly, the explanation is simpler. We know that she keeps her gun in her penny drawer. Ben's in the room. She gets her gun out of her penny drawer and comes up behind him. It doesn't take that long. It's not that complicated. Why wouldn't you just take this gun if I'm going to kill myself and bam, I'm done or under my chin or in my mouth? Why am I going to be flipping this thing backwards, upside down, any which way I can and do this? That doesn't make sense to me. And all of this is in a vacuum, not considering the fact that they've been married for two weeks and a day. Their world has fallen apart. Daddy's on the way to get him. He says, come on, Dad, I'll pack my bag. All those things that are going on in their life, we're just ignoring trying to make something right. physical, logistical work that doesn't work. I think we've been playing devil's advocate long enough. It may be possible to shoot yourself in the back of the head by twisting your arm like a pretzel, but come on, use your common sense. In light of all of your years working crime scenes and as a firearms expert, what is your opinion as to what happened in the bedroom that night? It could go either way. If you want to know from a scientific perspective if this is unusual, it is. Is that consistent with the suicide? No, I've never seen a suicide delivered in this, in this manner. I've never seen it. And neither has Max, she's I agree. So I think we all agree it's much more likely that it's a homicide. Yeah. Very true. You good? Good. After walking through the possible events of that evening, it seems more and more likely that Ben's death was not a suicide. Y'all ready to roll? And the only other person who could have pulled that trigger is our suspect, Samantha Price. But we're going to need more to prove that. We need to delve deeper into Samantha's world. You can sit right here in front. We've tracked down Taylor Smedley, Samantha's younger stepsister, to see what she can tell us about Samantha's mindset. What can you tell me about your stepsister, Samantha? You know, I love my stepsister, but she has always been a very angry person. I just know she's always had a personality where she will get revenge on someone. She's not the type of person to just let things go. What I can tell you that I know for sure is one time me and her were smoking in her bathroom mm -hmm. and I noticed there was a very large gap between the door and the door frame. It locks, but the gap between the door is big enough to where it won't stay locked shut. So the handle locks, but it still swings open. Right. 
Thank you so much for talking to us. You're welcome. All right. We'd like to learn more about how Samantha acted in past relationships. We were hoping to talk to Jeff, Samantha's ex-boyfriend. That should be the next one. Jeff wasn't comfortable giving a recorded statement, but his parents were willing to talk. Hello. Hi, I'm Hello. Martinez. Nice to meet you. I'm Kelly. Nice Hi. to meet you. Can you tell us about Samantha's demeanor? Did her and Jeff fight a lot? She called all the shots. He's very quiet. She's a very bad temper. She Always has. Bad temper. Ever since I've known her. What do you think's wrong with her? I think she's just spoiled. Hey, Mark. Don't forget to tell him about the time she stabbed me in the belly with a butter knife. Right. I'm Jeremy Doherty. Like I said, I'm a corporal working the case. I'd like to know more about what caused her to stab you. Well, they was at my house. It was a holiday. I don't know what, you know, what day it was. And I walked through the dining room. I just reached over and touched her. And man, she took a butter knife, stabbed me right across the belly. There's no doubt in my mind that she done what, what happened. There's no doubt in my mind. You mean that she she actually killed Ben? They didn't commit suicide? Yes, I, I honestly believe that. And the only thing I told Barbara, I'm glad you went and got Jeffrey when you did her. It, that could have been my son. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Your time. Do me a favor. I'm trying. Put the words to belong. It might be this street down here on our left. We've learned that Samantha Price, our suspect in the 2012 shooting death of her husband, Ben Cooper, had a history of anger and violence dating back to her relationship with Jeff. How you doing? Uh, sleeping. Sleeping. You wanna, you wanna get a shirt on? Can I talk to you for a few minutes? Yeah, can you give me a minute? Yeah. John Haight is a friend of Jeff's and he's never been questioned by the police. How long have you known Samantha? I met her through Jeff. Okay. Jeff, Jeff and I were in college together mm -hmm. after Ben had passed. She came over to the house, and then she starts telling us her side of the story. Exactly what did she tell y'all happened that night in the trailer? That he became uh, distraught. Ben became distraught. They were arguing, and he said, fine, then I'll, well, I'll just kill myself. And he, and he ran into the uh, the uh, the bedroom and got the gun and shot himself. Right in front of her. Did she say right. where, where she was at? She didn't really explain it like that. Like, she didn't say, I was here, he was there. Yeah, but, but she insinuated that she, she, that she saw it. it. We now have a witness that heard right out of the mouth of Samantha that she saw Ben shoot himself. This contradicts her initial story. I locked myself in the bathroom. I should have just stayed out there. I should have called the cops when he kicked the door. This is the other thing, too, is that years ago, we went over to Jeff and Sam for dinner one night. And her and Jeff weren't getting along, and they were fighting. And she's like, I'm leaving Jeff, and, and uh, I'm going to get custody of, of my kids, and uh, he's going to pay for it all. And if he ever tries anything, I got a gun. And it's unregistered, unlicensed, and nobody knows where I got it. I could make it look like a suicide. And them stupid cops, they'll never know what I'm doing. And I was like, well, you told me, and now I know about it. <laughs> and she's like, Jeff is never going to get that kid. And that if he tries to take him away, I'll shoot my kid and myself. She said that too? Oh, yeah. She's like, there's no way in hell he's ever going to get this kid. She thinks she's so smart. She thinks she's smarter than anybody yeah. that she's ever met and that she can manipulate them into doing whatever she wants. Samantha described to John how she could kill someone and get away with it, just like how we believe Ben died. Oh, my Lord. He's good. He's fantastic. So we're going straight to Samantha's. How far does she live? We've passed it a couple times. Oh, uh, that's right. That's yeah, right down that just... side road. She's just 10 minutes up the road from Grafton. You think it's as important just to catch her up in more lies as it is to necessarily get a, get a confession? She's right. never going to tell you she did it. Samantha Price is what I call a yapper or a talker. She can't shut up to save her life. 
And if we can get her to talk today like she has in the past, she might just give us a little bit more and all we need to solidify this case. She thinks y'all are also stupid anyway, you know, right. just play up to her. Good luck, boys. Hello. I need to talk to you for a couple minutes. We're still just doing some follow-up. I'm trying to get this Benjamin Cooper death investigation off my table. I think I've pretty much answered every question that I've been asked. And, you know, well. it was a very traumatic thing for me to go through. And I just don't want to, I don't want anything to do with that. When we talked to you three and a half years ago, you know, obviously there was, there was things that couldn't be answered that night. You know, as far as evidence was. Possibly couldn't have been answered. You guys are smart. I mean, the, the night to me was all a blur. All I know is that I came out of the bathroom, my husband was laying in the floor, and I tried to get him up, and he wasn't getting up. OK, I understand that it's traumatic, um, and that's why we have to ask the questions, because we weren't there. And well, you should have a recording of every question that was asked. I mean, I don't, I, I think I should probably have an attorney. If you guys want to ask me more questions. Well, if you change your mind, you have his number, OK? Yeah, yeah. all Thank right. Thank you very much. Samantha asked to speak to a lawyer, so that shuts down this interview. But without knowing it, she might have just slipped up. She did say, listen to the tape, so she realized it was being recorded. Yeah. Since watching her initial interview, mm. I've been wondering if Samantha knew she was being recorded. I didn't know. I did not know she would do this. And if her outpouring of emotion was just a big show for the camera. And now she might have just given us the answer. Oh, my God. We've talked to all the witnesses, examined the physical evidence, and now it's time to decide once and for all if the death of Ben Cooper was a suicide or a murder. Guys, you know why you can say this is not a suicide? Because number one, an entry wound to the back of the head, none of y'all have ever heard of. Even though it may be minutely, hypothetically possible, it's not very likely at all. Besides the entry wound, the trajectory itself from here to here. The trajectory being so difficult to pull off. He wasn't a gun person. Found a witness that can say that. Just so you guys know, uh -huh. he's really shitty with a gun. His dad was on his way to pick up his son. Do you really think that Ben was going to let his dad, the man he loved more than anybody in the whole wide world, find him with his brains played behind his head? If Ben would have done something like that to himself, he would have made sure you didn't know about it. You know, after all we've been able to address this week, this is not a suicide. I think we'd be right the possibility of suicide off. And then you prove that it is a murder case because of all these lies that Samantha Price has always told. She's lying about the gun. Where did the gun come from? I'm not sure. OK, well, it was my gun. My dad gave it to me. She's lying about the bathroom door. But my butt against the door near the door hinge in case he did try to kick the door in. You wouldn't have been able to shut the door with the mound of dirty clothes piled up high against the doorway. This is the woman who's talking about how she's going to do it one day. And we have a witness who now says it, Mr. Hate. I got a gun, and it's unregistered. And she's like, I can make it look like a suicide. And that's all there is to it. Yeah. We feel like we have a solid case against Samantha Price for the murder of Ben Cooper. But ultimately, it's prosecuting attorney John Board's decision. He's reviewed the case, and hopefully he agrees. Well, John, what are your thoughts about this case? It's just amazing how much work you all have done in such a short amount of time. There were things that came out in this that we had looked at, but we hadn't looked at it with that fresh eye. It makes a world of difference. What are your thoughts as far as what happens next with this case? Once we get everything together, we'll have an answer in four weeks. There's no doubt in my mind. She will be indicted for first-degree murder. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. John Board is excited about the case, and he plans to take it to a grand jury. He's confident that there will be justice for Ben Cooper and his family. Well, Jeremy, are you ready to go tell Ben's mom and dad everything? Let's go. Benjamin's parents, they've waited over three years for an answer regarding the death of their son. And so it's nice that things are progressing. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a long day and a long week. It has. 
We talked to a lot of people. We found some new witnesses. Based on all that we've done, in our opinion, there's no way anyone could say this is a suicide. I couldn't picture any way it was possible. Yeah. Well, you, you would be happy to know that John Board has taken the case to a grand jury for an indictment against Samantha Price. Good. You would love to hear how many people talk about how they felt about your son. And I think that's something you need to know in your heart. Yeah. When we had his memorial service, there were 300 people there. You don't realize how, how many lives one person can touch until something like that happens. You know, I really wish he realized that because he didn't really. That he didn't know how much everybody loved him. We heard that too. Yeah. Let's give him a hug. Thank you. I can tell you that if Ben is able to know what's happening, he's forever thankful. Today, a special grand jury was convened in Taylor County. All the grand jury members returned a true bill for an indictment for first degree murder against Samantha Metzger. Uh, we just arrested Samantha for murder. She's in cuffs right now outside of her house. Don't go anywhere. An all-new Cold Justice Sex Crime starts now on TNT. is in our typical cold case. It's only about three years old. It's kind of nice for a change, huh? Yeah. For the first time, we actually had the elected prosecutor ask us to help with the case to see if we could bring in some new eyes. On January the 26th, 2012, 24-year-old Ben Cooper was found by his wife, Samantha Price, lying on their bedroom floor with a gun beside him and a fatal gunshot wound to his head. Even though it was an apparent suicide, the police suspected foul play. So Ben Cooper and Samantha Price, they were only married two and a half weeks before his death. And we know that Ben had a lot of psychological issues. Ben was an easygoing, sweet boy, but it's kind of sad because the same sensitive nature that drew people to him also made him vulnerable to the darker emotions he often felt. Even when it seems obvious, as a suicide, you always treat it like a murder. And then you let the facts lead you to... Confirm or rebut. Right. There's only one witness, Samantha Price. And she said, the victim killed himself. He has access to a gun. Then why would she not be telling the truth? If it ends up being that her story is plausible, maybe we can get this cloud off of her head. True, and as far as why they got married and what possibly could have gone so wrong, two and a half weeks later, we have no idea. We gotta try and figure it out. It has been 16 years and still no answer. The police consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are y'all? John Ward, nice prosecutor. Nice to meet you. Orlando. Jeremy Doherty. I'm excited that a prosecutor wants some help. In a small county, we don't have a lot of resources. So when I reached out, I reached out for a purpose. Well, show us where you want us to work, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Being invited by the prosecutor himself is like being invited by my own people. 
If he wants us to do something, that's what we're going to do. Thank you again. And I'm excited about it, and I hope that we can make some progress. If this happens at the beginning of 2012, y'all never have really quit working on this case, then. You never put it to the side. No, it sat on the top of my desk, and I looked at it and tried to figure out what more things that we can do. This, from the beginning, has been the most important case that I've ever had to investigate. Uh, so it's always been front and center for the past three years. How old was Ben when this happened, Jeremy? He was 24 years old. A baby. Everybody said he was sweet, though. And... Yeah, that's right. Everybody said that he was very intelligent. Uh, he loved children. He thought of himself as like a guardian to his nieces and nephews. He moved in with Samantha about six months before all this. Samantha Price was the 29-year-old mother of a five-year-old little boy. They met in the fall around October of 2011, and they ended up getting married in January 2012. And when they got married, it seems like things kind of went downhill pretty quickly. Can you start out by telling us what happened that night? It was January 26, 2012. At approximately 11 p.m. that evening, Samantha Price had called 911 to report that her husband, Ben, had shot himself. The fire department arrived on scene. They saw Benjamin Cooper laying face up in the doorway of his bedroom with a single gunshot wound to the head. Then ended up dying en route to the hospital. So what all do we know happened that night based on what Samantha told y'all? Well, Samantha told us is that night they'd been drinking. they had had an argument because Ben wanted to go to sleep and he wanted Samantha allegedly to come to sleep with him, but she wanted to stay up and play on the computer and listen to music. He gets into an argument with me, it escalates, and he says, well, you, I don't even want to be here. After the argument, Ben left. Samantha says she calls Ken, which is Ben's dad, to have Ken come get Ben. And at some point, Ben comes back and it reportedly breaks the glass on the back kitchen door. When he kicked the back door in, I was actually really scared then. So I went back into my bedroom and locked the bathroom door. Said Samantha claims that she was in the master bath uh, when she heard what she describes as a balloon popping. She opens the door and allegedly sees Ben laying on his back with his hands down by his side, the gun still in his left hand. Okay. And everybody there is thinking, this just doesn't add up. I mean, the way that Ben was shot, I mean, he was shot in the lower center base of his skull. And I've worked a lot of suicides, and nobody's ever shot themselves in the back of the head, in my experience. Right. And so obviously that was the first red flag, was where he was shot. I haven't worked many questionable suicide cases. But I know it's not common to see self-inflicted gunshot wounds to the back of the head. It doesn't necessarily make this a murder, but it's a big reason the police have always had doubts about Samantha's story. All right, guys, we're going to start off with, is this a suicide? Set the mood for that night, according to Samantha. They're fighting. She says that they've both been drinking. Consistency, she tells Dad, she tells 911, she tells the cops. Samantha consistently says suicide, and also from hearing him on the 911 tape, Dad seemed to be going along with it. 911, do you have an emergency? Yes, my son's shot himself, and the ambulance is supposed to be in route. It seems like he believed it, too. And the dad confirmed that he had been diagnosed with mental illness. He'd been hospitalized for it before? Yes. Considering Ben's history of mental instability and past hospitalizations for depression, there's a very real possibility that he took his own life. So understanding his mindset at the time will be crucial to this case. You know, that's a lot of points that we're going to need to address under suicide. Now we need to focus on our only suspect, Samantha Price. What's your number one reason why you don't think this is a suicide, Jeremy? And the entrance rune is in the back of his head, and the lies she made about the gun. She said that she Never seen the gun before, and she didn't know where Ben got it. Where did the gun come from? I'm not sure. When does she start to change to, it is my gun, and it was in my panty drawer? Yeah, that was after we brought her back down to the Grafton Police Department. OK, well, it was my gun. My dad gave it to me. And then she changes to? Trying to cover for Ben because he's got mental issues, and she didn't think he's supposed to have a gun. I was seriously afraid that you guys would think it was Ben's gun. He is not supposed to be allowed to own a gun if he has ever been committed. When I saw the interview, she's sitting there and lamenting and crying and all that, and I couldn't oh tell if she knew that she's being filmed. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I'm watching her going, OK, it seems pretty genuine, but where's the camera? How obvious is it? I'd have to double check on that. 
This case is tricky. There are only two people that know what happened that night, and one of them isn't alive to tell his side of the story. Either Samantha is innocent, and we need to allow her time to mourn and move on with her life, or she's a killer, and we need to do everything that we can to put her behind bars and get justice for Ben. We're going to go meet Marcia and Kenneth Cooper. They are Ben's parents. And they're not together anymore? No, they're not together anymore. They do keep in contact with me quite frequently. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Well, we just wanted to come and check in with you. Okay. Um, what are your best memories of your son? Easy kid, easy baby. He was always happy. Did he ever talk about what he wanted to do when he got older? He came home one day and he said, I know what I'm going to do, Dad. I want to be a forest ranger, which I thought he would be great at. You know, it was more than just a father-son type experience. To me, Ben was my best buddy. That night where Samantha calls you, what are you thinking about everything? Samantha called me and told me that they had had a fight. And I said, give him the phone and let me talk to him. There won't be any problem. She ultimately did just hand him the phone, and he was fine. She handed him the phone? Mm-hmm. First thing he said is, I think I really screwed up, Dad. It was the first thing he said. When Ben says to you, I think I really screwed up, Dad, you yeah. think he's talking about? The fight that they had and him walking out. Breaking the door. And then breaking the door. And I said, well, anything can be fixed, you know? And I said, I, I got plastic, I got tape. That's what I was planning on doing, patching up the door and getting him out of there. Okay. And I was at the red light. She calls me. She says, Ben just pulled a gun from somewhere and shot himself. And, and I said, what do you mean he just pulled a gun from somewhere and shot himself? You know, because I couldn't believe what she said. When I got to Ben, he was laying close to the doorway of the bedroom with his hands above his head. And he was lying there, still breathing, but in gasps. Have you not heard all this before? I'm sorry. Everybody says, I know what you feel like, but unless you've lost a child, there's an emptiness that is just like someone yanked out a part of your heart and there's a big hole and you nothing fills it up. I know it's difficult. We wouldn't put you through this unless we thought there was potential. I understand that, and okay. I, I am grateful that you're I appreciate okay. it. Give me a hug. Oh, okay. Hang in there, okay? Oh, thank you. To lose your child is something that I can't even imagine how you stand. I don't really know how you live the rest of your life with all that spinning around in your head. This will be your case. You remember your whole career. Oh, yeah. Yes, I do. Oh, my gosh. I've been seeing you forever. I know. This is Jeremy. Jeremy, Jeremy I'm Yolanda. Yeah, nice to meet you. Meet you. Meet you. Have, have we had one younger, Yolanda? <laughs> no, he's pretty young, okay? <laughs> I'm here in Taylor County, West Virginia, to help determine if the 2012 shooting death of Ben Cooper was a suicide or a homicide at the hands of his wife, Samantha Price. You ready to talk to Mr. Nodell and Courtney? Yeah, the ballistic experts. Yes. When determining whether a gunshot wound is self-inflicted, it is important to understand the location, orientation, and trajectory of the wound. So at the request of prosecuting attorney John Board, we've brought in two ballistics experts, Matt Nodell and Max Courtney. What does the firearm tell us to start with? The firearm is called a REC P8 LA Fury 25 semi-automatic pistol. I've mocked in a line to represent the approximate direction